Eager Outdoors Nation, um, I have the privilege for a job of interviewing people who are absolutely remarkable. Some people have been down very, very deep distances into the ocean. Some people have um, summited Everest. And today's guest, well, I'm not too sure how he achieves what, he's, what he achieves, but um, I think he may well show us in this conversation together. Um, so today we have Paralympian medal winning archer, Matt Stusman. Matt, welcome to the interview. Hello, hello. Welcome from cold, cold Iowa. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So I didn't give too much away in that introduction. So what should the world know about Matt? <laughs> well, I was born without any arms and I make a living shooting a bow. That's basically it in short. <laughs> So let, right, let's let's just jump into it because um, how the fuck does that work? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is funny because it was uh, 2010. I was sitting on the couch and trying to figure out how I was going to put food on the table. And I see a guy get a bow and he's shooting and I'm like, I need to do that. So the first thing I did was Google how to teach an armless man how to shoot a bow. <laughs> But in 2010, there was <laughs> the things that popped up were not <laughs> how to teach an armless man how to shoot a bow. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a friend of mine who's a bushcraft instructor, and um, he says if you put bushcraft into Google, you can click the normal search, but then you can click random search. And um, apparently, all sorts of dodgy shit comes up if you click random search. <laughs> <laughs> so, same same if you type in uh armless archer <laughs> it intrigued me though when i saw it it intrigued me um i i grew up on a farm um i have eight brothers and sisters and my dad was the primary breadwinner so we hunted a lot when i was little i've hunted with guns and stuff and i and so i i always had that knowledge of going out in the woods and, and learning but for me on that day because of everything else that i tried it was like my last hope like it was like i gotta get a bow i gotta learn how to shoot this thing and i need to put food on the table and so i went to the local archery range and asked for a bow and they all looked at me like i was nuts because <laughs> they're just handing some armless guy a bow and of course no one knew how to show me how to do it so I pretended I had arms in my head. I hold the bow with my right foot, just like somebody would with their right arm. And they draw their bow back with their left arm. I would use my right shoulder. And by doing that, I was able to actually teach myself within two weeks how to accurately shoot a bow enough that I could go in the woods and harvest um, a deer, actually. No way. So you're taking it out of the woods and going for some what some white tails or what's the what's the thing? Yeah. Yeah. So this is what's amazing about Iowa and one of the reasons why I love it. Deer here are really big. White tailed deer are big. So you could shoot a doe that's probably, you know, 180, 150, 180 pounds. And your tag is like 12 bucks. That's a lot of meat for $12. <laughs> You must make the butcher very upset at that point in time. Yeah, well, actually, believe it or not, um, I butcher my own deer. Rip. Okay. <laughs> so um, I, I want to. I'll come back to butchering your own meat because um, I, that, that's, that's another. Um, I've got some stories around that from my own world of hunting and whatever else. Um, so it took you a few weeks, and you sussed out how to go and accurately fire this bow. Um, or shoot this bow rather and get yourself a deer that's that's beyond incredible dude you know i it's i was so determined to figure it out and like i everybody was like there's no way you're gonna be able to do that and for me it never in my mind it was never an option of i won't be able to do this i literally was like this is my only option and so when you get your mind going in that direction as i'm sure everyone um has had that at one point in their life everything kind of comes together and it works and yeah i was able to successfully harvest a deer it's funny because um once i got it home <laughs> i hung it in the tree so it could like bleed out and stuff 
And my boys at that time were pretty young and they went to school and told their teacher that I caught a deer, I tied it up and then I shot it. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, you guys are going to get me in trouble. Like, you can't have, the, have the police <laughs> and social services arriving at your front door in 10 seconds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Wow. It, it, uh, it was a pretty amazing, amazing. I, I might have just uh, shed a little tear when I shot that deer because it it's like it knew it. I had just learned how to shoot. I had made up my mind that that's how I was going to put food on the table. And I go out in the woods and I literally s- just sit down by a stump on this trail. And probably an hour later, it literally just walks right by me at like 10 yards. No. Like, it, yeah. And I'm like, there it is. So like I'm sitting on the ground and I'm drawing my bow. And it's like looking at me and not even running off. I'm like, <laughs> it's probably like, how's the guy with that arm pulling back a bow? It probably <laughs> was the deer. <laughs> it was probably what the deer was thinking. <laughs> it's interesting. It was, I was amazing. I interviewed a um, a tracker the other day um, on on the podcast, and he was saying that the animals have become very habitualized to the human. To, to normal humanness. So he was saying, you know, if you're tracking a deer and come across the deer, don't stop, carry on walking. Because when you stop, they feel mm-hmm. threatened. If you carry on walking, mm-hmm. they're like, oh, that's cool. And so mm-hmm. maybe there was a bit of them that saw you and like the the, sh- the outline didn't look quite right to them. So they were like, oh, <laughs> we don't, don't know what to do with this. Yeah, I... <laughs> You know, it was just one of those things where I think it was just all meant to be. And and that fueled everything that drove me to where I'm at today. Like I I was like, I can do this. This is this is what I'm doing. I I found my Michael Jordan moment, as I say. Hell yeah. Wow. Hmm. So tell me, as as a kid, you strike me as the guy who um uh wouldn't let much hold you back. Um, but but how was your childhood? (laughs) <laughs> okay so um when i was born i was uh, you know was born without any arms and at that time my parents didn't know what to do because they never i mean it was kind of rare i guess back at that at, at that time and so they asked the doctors what they should do and the doctors said it's going to cost millions of dollars to raise me i'm always going to have to have help i'm always going to have to have somebody to do everything for me my entire life so at three months old they put me up for adoption and then i was adopted at 13 months old into the amazing family that i call my parents and my family um it was pretty awesome because my at a very young age my parents decided to teach me how to adapt to the world and instead of the world adapting to me and and I had, you know, chores I had to do. I I mean, they treated me just like a normal child. Like I had to go feed the cows and wake up early and put the pigs on the, in the trailer so we could take them to market. Like I had to do all that stuff, just like my brothers and sisters. Um, For the most part, it was like a pretty normal, I would say like a normal farm life. Like it was like, (sighs) there's nothing that sticks out in my mind that, would made me think that I was different when I was growing up. My brothers and sisters picked on me like normal. <laughs> but you know, because of how they raised me, they they wanted me to try lots of things. I I'm not even joking. Like I I tried to ride a bull when I was like 12. Yeah, like they <laughs> with the, with the you, like you reins in your this? teeth or something. You want me to tell you the story? Yeah, go for it. I'm intrigued. Okay. So because my parents were like, you know, find what you love and let's figure it out and, and adapt. So in my mind, I'm like, I can do anything. And I decided at 12, like I was going to be a professional bull rider. So I dressed up in, in like the flannel shirts and cowboy boots and all that stuff. And I went out to the barn and we caught Billy. Billy is our biggest bull we had on the farm. And he was only probably like 800, 900 pounds because he was like, you know, one and a half years old or whatever. But to me, he was huge. And I brought him over and had a bucket of feed by the fence. And so as he's eating, I climbed up on his back and he's been around me before. So he was fine with it. But I remember on TV, they tie a rope around his belly. So my brother ties a rope around his belly and I'm sitting there like thinking how I'm going to hold on because I still don't know how I'm going to hold on to this thing. 
And my brother's like, dude, he's like, we should tie your long sleeve. I had a long sleeve shirt on. He's like, we should tie your sleeve to the rope. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to be the best bull rider in the world. So I'm like, yeah, like, let's do it. I was like, make sure you double knot it. Cause I don't want it to come off. <laughs> <laughs> So I tie myself, he ties me to this bull and I'm getting ready to like, you know, get the bull to go run or buck or whatever. And my brother, like the bull's not moving. And my brother thought it'd be funny to take, we have like a electric prod that you use to kind of get animals to go. And he shot, he shocks this bull in, in the rump, in the, in the butt. And this thing starts running down the field and like, I'm like flopping and I go flying. And I remember, w- I, m- <laughs> I remember waking up on the ground and, uh, I like look around and, and my back is itchy and I look down and I wasn't wearing a shirt and the bull is still running around the, the field with my shirt tied to the rope. And what I learned was that's what a concussion felt like. And then I learned that I wasn't going to be a bull rider what saved me was that it was a button up shirt. So when the bull tossed me, all the buttons broke and I, I fell out of the shirt. <laughs> that's, that's how, like, that's how my childhood went. I got lots of stories of stuff I've tried and done. <laughs> like, and my parents, my parents didn't say anything. Like they didn't say, did you learn a lesson? What were you doing on that thing? Like, I was amazed. Like they let me kind of learn my lesson. I mean, I, I mean, not that they just let me do whatever I wanted, because they didn't know I was doing it. Cause I'm sure if they did, they probably would have said no, <laughs> but that all led me up to now. I mean, that, that kind of drive and that kind of childhood let me, I believe into who I am today. It's funny, regardless of whether it's you or somebody who's completely fully, fully able, fully able, we've got all their arms and legs attached mm-hmm. to them, whatever you want to call those people like me, um, is, uh, if you suggest to somebody that it might be dangerous and they shouldn't do it, they'll probably convince themselves that they shouldn't do it and they can't do it. But I, I've got a little daughter and she often says to me, like, Daddy, can I use your axe? Because I do quite a lot of bushcraft and survival stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, you put a few parameters in place, but I'm like, yep, go for it. And, um, <laughs> you know, she's four and a half years old now and she uses a chef's knife to help me cook dinner and she's got her own bushcraft knife and mm-hmm. no cuts, no hospital visits. Um, mm-hmm. But I think if I'd have told her um, that's dangerous or be careful or mm-hmm. don't do it, mm-hmm. I, I think it would have been a whole different story. Oh, I, I agree with you on that one. Uh, it's just like my boys, like they – you know, I, I shoot in the house and stuff like that. And people are like, well, don't you have your kids run around? But my kids know what a bow is. They've been around it for 10 plus years now. They respect it. They know what it's about. In fact, they have, they have bows that they shoot too, you know, like, you know, we're, we're fine. I feel like if you teach them in the right way, it's a good thing. Yeah. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, in fact, go on. No, you carry on. Tell me. uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, you were talking about your daughter with the knives and stuff or whatever. And I was just going to tell you the other day we went out and I threw axes with my foot and I was like getting them to stick at this ax throwing competition place. I was able to like toss them and they were sticking. And I was like, what? So, <laughs> so I, that's my relation. You, you're like, we'll go with the ax. And there you go. I can, I can throw an ax. You can throw it. So you clamp it between your feet and then lie on your back and away you go, something like that. Uh, I had I um I have a video. Let me I'll just bring it up real quick and show you as best I can. Cause it's kind of hard to explain. <laughs> it's gonna take me a little bit, but once I find it, I'll show you. So but I, I I stand on one leg and I hold the axe in my right foot and I kind of like throw it like underhand almost. Does that make sense? I'd love to be in your brain when it comes to solving these problems about how the bloody hell am I going to achieve this? <laughs> well, I want I literally want to try everything uh, as much as possible because I like I want to live life, you know, like I I just want to. 
I don't know. So I, I always figure out stuff. Like I, I have to figure out stuff. Yeah, that's incredible. So um, what what have you um, what what's been a struggle with you? But before you took up archery, what what were the sort of struggles that you had to overcome to go and step forwards and do achieve everything you've you've achieved? <clears throat> Uh, during that part of my life, the struggle at that time was, uh, nobody was, nobody would hire me. Nobody would give me a chance. And it wasn't cause I was qualified, you know, I was qualified for the jobs, but like, I'd have people tell me, you don't have any arms. How are you going to be able to do that? Or if you had prosthetic arms, then I would hire you. I'm like, I haven't had prosthetic arms. Last time I had them, I was eight. I wore, the, I wore them to show and tell in my first year at school just because it was cool, right? Like, I like I, I got tired of everybody just looking at me and making decisions based on what I look like versus what I could actually do, you know? And that's frustrating. The awareness now, though, is a lot better. Like, how it was, you know, 11 years ago versus now it's completely different because there's so much awareness to physical disabilities and what people can actually do you know mm. and so if i needed to get a job now it'd be a lot easier um but back then that was a struggle because i had i had two boys i had to put food on their you know in their mouths and get clothes and and it was it was a pretty it, i felt it was a pretty low part point in my life for sure because everybody wants to provide right I mean, I strive to do that and, and nobody was, yeah, nobody was letting me do it. You know, like. It, it strikes me that a lot of people's brains have shifted in the past 15, 20 years. When I, uh, when I first started learning to become a coach, I, I went on a, a program that was about how to take disabled people kayaking. And mm -hmm. it was full of lots of, uh, tell them to do it like this. And, then when I actually got to go and take some disabled people kayaking, I was like, yeah, but none of this shit works. And um, I, I worked with a, a lovely a lovely lady called Victoria who one day said, Rob, just shut up. How about you ask me to go figure it out and I'll come back to you in a few minutes. And I'm like, can it be that? Mm -hmm. And um, the, the truth is, it is that easy. Um, mm -hmm. so as opposed to saying you can't do it, say, well, hey, Matt, show me how you can do it. And the world changes in front of your eyes. Yep. Yeah, for sure. I think um, a lot of people that have disabilities, um, the way that they look at problems or problem solving, I think is a lot different. I, I'm not saying like they can train their brain to be like, look at things or puzzles at a little bit of a different angle because they're forced into doing it. Like, like I'm forced into learning how I'm going to tie my shoes and then put my shoes on. So I, every day I, I run into something that I got to think on how to do uniquely differently than if I would have had arms, I guess. And so I feel like one, one thing that is amazing to me is like uh, at the Paralympic games, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of athletes and we all share the same, like we all overcame something to be there. It wasn't like we all just trained real hard. Like we had to overcome something first and figure out what we want to do. Then we had to train real hard to get there. And we all have that like unspoken connection like it's it's awesome. It's 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 pretty much the top of the world, I guess. The top of the world. I can imagine. So top how of the you, world. How did you go from getting a bow, teaching yourself how to shoot it, getting a deer, to going and wearing a USA tracksuit and wandering off to the Paralympics? That's a pretty epic. <laughs> so after I shot the deer, you know, I was of course excited. Um I wasn't going to go, I like I had, was going to put the bow up. Uh, I now had food on the table and now I am going to go try to find a job. And I had a buddy of mine go, you're pretty good at that. In a very short amount of time, in a matter of a couple months, like every time we shoot, you're out shooting me. He's like, you're, you should go to a tournament. And I, so I Googled archery tournaments close by and there was one maybe three hours from my house. And I'm like... I mean, what I'm just going to go there and see what it's about is what I was doing. Mm. Um, I walked in the door and immediately fell in love with, because I'm always competitive. Um, I, I immediately fell in love with the, that sport because I'll, show you, I'll tell you why. Archery doesn't stereotype the athlete. 
most sports do. If you're a basketball player, you got to be certain height and be able to dunk and jump a certain height. If you're a football player, same thing. So, like all, pretty much all the sports, you know, except for archery, the art, the bow doesn't care if you have arms or don't have arms. Mm. And, I, and I could sit in a chair and shoot this bow with the best in the world and beat them. Like that, that it, like it had me hooked. I, if I was a catfish, I would have swallowed the hook. <laughs> like it had me good. Like I immediately knew what I wanted to do. Yeah, because yeah, there's there's. <sighs> There's no judgment from the bow or the arrow. It's just, can you get it closest to the center mm-hmm. of the target? Yes or no. I mean, that's all there is. Yeah. really. Right. Yeah. I, I found that target archery made me a better hunter. Um, and hunting made me, in fact, I, a lot of people, I don't know. I, I tried to explain this once, but being, being a hunter as well as a target archer, they both help each other. When you're in the woods, you have to, you usually only have one shot and you have to make it count. Mm. Right. Like you don't get 500 shots at the same. I mean, if you do, that's pretty rare. But, <laughs> and when you're, when you're shooting uh, for a medal or, or a prize for money or something like that, like you got to make that shot count. Right. So they coexist really well. Um, another thing that I found out that, that helps me is a lot of people get like buck fever or they get the adrenaline pump in and, and here comes a big deer. And I was able to control that in the woods. So now when I'm shooting, I'm able to control it at a, at a tournament. And then at a tournament, since I'm controlling it, when I go back out in the woods later in the year, I can control it. Like I've been there, like, I don't, there's so many things and they both help me and benefit what I, what I do, I guess. That's so funny. Cause, um, for all sorts of reasons, I went hunting for the first time in my life last year, uh, in September last year. Um, and it was all sorts of reasons. Like somebody challenged me that every time you're eating a steak, you're pulling the trigger on a cow. So are you really man enough to pull the trigger? That was the sort of conversation. And I'm like, well, uh-huh. I suppose there's only one way to find out. Um, and I- I'm stood there with a rifle uh, in the back of a truck with a, with a tripod on the roof of the truck. And there's a, a kudu, which is a, a big deer, um, a little bit smaller mm-hmm. than a moose, um, mm-hmm. about 300 yards away. And the, the sensation going through my body was exactly the same as a, a, a kayaking race just before the gun goes mm-hmm. bang. There was mm-hmm. dry mouth, uh, f- funny heart rate that you can't quite get to grips with. Um, it was this exact same sensation. And uh, so I could see how the two can link together so easily for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's, I think that's why I was able to excel as fast as I did because I started literally shooting in, in 2010. In, and in fact, it was October. And I went to my first tournament, January of 2011, and went to trials to see if I got to go to London and beat everybody on the team and miss the world record by like two points and went on the, the in 2012 to go to London, right? Like, that's like almost unheard of. But I think it's because I, you know, I, I think it's just because I grew up how I grew up. And here's another another interesting thing is, since I was born this way, my whole life I've had people like look at me. It doesn't matter what I do. If I'm at a restaurant, people are staring, looking, and and so at very like at probably six or seven, at that point, I didn't care what people thought. I just was me. I, I didn't let any of that bug me. Mm. I didn't care that people watched. I didn't care that people were pointing and saying stuff behind my back. Like I just didn't care. So now when I'm on the range and I'm shooting and there's 10,000 people watching. I don't hear him. I don't see him. Whereas the guy beside me has never been in my situation. Now all of a sudden he has 10,000 people looking at him. <laughs> you see? And, and so he's now he's in a whole new scenario he's never been in before where I've been in that my whole life. Yeah, I, well, I was I was just thinking a very good friend of mine, Neil, had a motorbike accident in his early 20s and lost his right arm and smashed his left arm up so bad that he's got about... 40 or 50% functionality in it um, and his hand as well. It's not very, uh, yeah, he, he often refers to his left arm as a dead weight. I mean, it's just 
it, it's there. And mm-hmm. I guess you haven't had to go through what he went through, which was having learning everything in your entire life to your mid twenties to have two arms, two hands, two everything else. Yeah, you go back to like age zero again, I guess. If if like Neil that got amputated and whatever else. Mm-hmm. Wow. Cool. So mm-hmm. tell me about the first Paralympics. Like, talk to me about that story because you got selected. And then, uh, and then it must have been a whirlwind through to that following summer where you got on a plane and went to London. Yeah, so um, I wasn't expecting to go. And then I went to trials and I crushed it. Um, I was the top U.S. guy going into the games. At that point, nobody even knew who I was uh, as far as internationally, really, uh, because I literally had just came onto the scenes. I go to my first games with no, I'm just happy I'm there. Like, I'm happy I made it. I, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about winning. I was just like soaking it all in like a big sponge, basically. Um, shot qualification round and was shy of the Paralympic record by like seven points. And it was like drenching rain and wind. Like, it was like one of the toughest conditions I've been in. And, you know, obviously up to that point. Uh, I was qualified number one out of everyone that was there and ended up making it to the gold medal match where I did lose to uh, the guy from Finland uh, who was a really good shooter. Um, but I, le- I learned a valuable lesson because when I went into the gold medal match, like I said, I was so happy that I was there. Like I didn't, I didn't even, <sighs> mindset's different now, but then I was like, I don't even care if I get to second place. Like I'm just happy that I'm still shooting and I'm having like the best time of my life. Yeah. You know, like I, it was like the most amazing experience. And I, I, the best part about it was is when I was on the podium and they gave me my medal and, and uh, all of the flags go up and I, I see the American flag and I see my parents in, in the audience and stuff. And it's like my whole entire life did a circle at that point because when I was younger, I wanted to be the best at something. I just didn't know what it was. And so I literally tried everything. So at one point in my life, I wanted to be a NASCAR driver. And I learned and taught myself how to drift. But obviously, I never made it into racing in, into NASCAR. Then there was a time in my life that I was going to be the best basketball player in the world. And I literally spent years and years playing basketball, trying to be a Michael Jordan. And, and obviously, I, that never happened. And like I have all these stories of me trying like to do these things. And I would literally put a hundred percent effort into them for years to master them just to realize like, I'm not going to be able to do that. So when I'm on the podium, it all kind of came in a circle. It's like, I like, it's like I had accomplished all those things I wanted to do when I was younger. Uh, obviously it wasn't basketball or racing. It was through archery, but it's still the same feeling. It's still the same, mm-hmm. everything uh, reaching the top of any sport, you know? And, and tell me, there's uh, over the past probably three or four Olympic cycles, by the way, I was at, I was coaching at London 2012. So I know what you mean about the weather in London 2012. I was there as a coach. <laughs> um, uh, but it strikes me over the past, maybe four Olympic cycles that the margin between Paralympic metrics and whatever you want to call the normal, the other Olympics, um, the fully mm-hmm. able Olympics. I don't know what you call them. Um, I'm, I'm just, so you know, I'm likely to be very unpolitically correct as I stumble across my words and I'll just like put a apology out for that now. Um, like what, what's that margin look like for, for yourself with archery, the difference? There's no difference. So after, uh, so I had an amazing 2012 games um rio the 2016 games were amazing as well um i actually lost in my second round to equipment malfunction and even with my even with my equipment malfunction making me lose no one beat my score not even the guys who went on to win the gold medal so like i was shooting that good like Mm -hmm. i was like uh, but i obviously i didn't i didn't podium um, the very next year I made the switch to able-bodied and, uh, ended up making the United States 
able-bodied archery team based on my performances. In fact, I actually won the biggest tournament um, in the United States against the best able-bodied archers in the world. That's friggin' incredible, mate. Wow. It, it's one of my highlights for sure, because I literally beat the number the, the at that point in time, US had uh five. Yeah. Uh, what was it? In the top five best archers in the world at that time, based on their rank, we had three of them that were shooting that tournament with me. And then in the top 10 in the world, we had like three or three, three more, maybe like we, we were dominant that year. So literally the number one ranked archers in the world were there at that tournament. And I came out on top and <laughs> I won by like 20 points. I don't even know how that happens. Like it, it was, yeah, I don't know. It was. That's not winning. That's was, kicking ass. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't miss. I literally couldn't miss. Like it was one of those days where I was there to prove a point and it didn't matter what was happening. Like I, they, they thought it was a fluke. So the very next day they had, an, um, after I won that event, they had another separate tournament. And this one was like with like head to head matches, and I literally beat them all again. <laughs> like I like I don't know. Basically, <laughs> the margin between able bodied and paras anymore. We are right up there with those guys. Like we shoot the same scores as they do. We can shoot uh, perfect scores. Um, I have the record for shooting perfect scores uh, at fifty meters. So like. Anybody can win at that point. It's like who's got their game face and who, who's going to do good today. So, is there a time where you say I can't be bothered with the Paralympic Games? I go, I want to go to the to the other one, or I want to do both. <laughs> I definitely want to do both. I will continue to shoot para the Paralympic Games until I'm too old to not qualify or, or my skill is not as good because the Paralympics means a lot to me. Mm. It's it's not just about competing. There's a there you influence a lot of people. You help a lot of people. There's a lot of good that comes from those games, and I want to be a part of that until I can't compete anymore. And then if they will let me somehow, maybe through the back door, however I need to be a part of it, like I want to be a part of it because it's changed my life in a huge way, and I want to use that to help other people as well. So the Paralympics will never go away. Um, Maybe someday I will see if I can do the Paralympics and the Olympics if they let me. Um, as of right now, it doesn't work that way. Uh, maybe someday they'll change it, but yeah. So tell me, what, uh, London 2012, the whole of London changed for that summer. I mean, it was one of the most remarkable English summers I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. What? What was going through your head as you get you arrive, you get to Heathrow, you get off the plane, you go to the athletes village, there's all that stuff. Like, how are you feeling and what's going on? Uh, it was, I don't know. I was pretty much speechless for like the first two days. I didn't know what to do. I just was like, we're like soaking it all in. Were you ever in the, were you ever in the food hall or the chow hall? Um, once or twice, but we were at mostly at Eton Dorney at the rowing and kayaking venue for most of it. But yeah, once or twice. Okay. Like, yeah. So you saw how big it was. Huge. Yeah, I read that they could put 880 school buses in there. Yeah, those. Yeah, or a small Boeing air aircraft or something like that. There was another yeah. thing I saw. It's just ginormous. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was so hard for me not to eat the whole entire place every time I went in there because I was like, "There's so much food, it's amazing!" <laughs> like, I, whatever I want, in free McDonald's. <laughs> like it was, it was, it was tough to be like, "Stay on your routine, stay on your routine." I don't, that game will be the best game for me because it was my first one. It's the one that um, obviously I did well in, but it's the memory that I made because literally the year before. I was just learning how to shoot and didn't even know about what the games were at that point. So to go from all that to where it went to where it led, I don't know. It's never going away in my brain. It's definitely the best games uh, to date for sure. To date, yeah. You there's there's still mm -hmm. a uh, you know next one. Are you going to go to Tokyo? 
I I mean, that's the plan unless they can unless they cancel it. Oh, is that a? Um, I know this obviously has been put off by a year, but you still think there's a chance of them canceling it this year? Uh, they claim they're going to go ahead with it no matter what, but everybody says that, and then stuff happens. Uh, I know that if they postpone it this year, they're just going to cancel it completely. <laughs> so it has to happen this year or not happen. Um, we're training like it's going to happen as of now. Um, you know, they got protocols and all that stuff into effect and trials begin in April. Um, so we probably won't have any fans, you know, but I don't care. It's okay. Like I, I just, I want to go back to Tokyo. I've been there before several times. Um, and I love it there. So. Wow. So what does your training look like for all that? Uh, right now I'm just getting ready to ramp up again. So when COVID stopped, when COVID initially started, I was pretty much at, like trying to peak at the perfect time. So one of the best things that I ever did was take a break. I didn't shoot my bow for like several months. Like it was good just to like have your body heal and relax and just kind of reset. You know, if you, you do the same every, you know, I was shooting for, so for the last 10 years, I was shooting, you know, three to four hours a day for the last 10 years straight, pretty much, unless I was on a plane. So it was like a much needed, like, I feel healthy. I'm a, like, I feel great. In 2016, I weighed like 218 pounds at the games. Uh, and now I'm like 163 and, and I, I'm stronger right now than I was before. And I'm down to like 12% body fat and like, I'm healthy and like, I'm strong so I can shoot good. Like my, my, my shooting's good too. So like, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> I think you're, I think for a lot of professional sports people last year extended a lot of people's careers for a long time further because they actually, yes. as you say, they actually got a chance to fully recover, fully rehab. Yes. No, and do it without having that pressure of the next competition is only six weeks away and I've got to get better for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you got six months. Archery never, archery never quits. Like literally, if I wanted to, I could shoot a major tournament every single month of the year. Like it, it's nonstop. Like there's as soon as outdoor gets done in like November or October, um, indoor starts in November, and then you have the indoor season, and that's huge, right? So you literally for ten years never get any time off. You're literally shooting events. I'm training for events every single month. In fact, some months have two events in them, so you can shoot, you know, eighteen to twenty events a year if you wanted to. And it just is nonstop. So you're right. This last year, like, put a halt to some things. And people don't understand how amazing it is to, like, even mentally just have a reset and just take some time to just, you know, it doesn't go away. It's still there, you know, but it's good for you. It is. Although I, I was talking to a friend the other day and they were, they were saying if um, a year ago when uh, we got we got put on quite a hard lockdown at the start of COVID um, and he said, you know, it sounded like a couple of weeks to lounge around and watch Netflix and that sounded like the best thing ever. You know, if somebody had said to me, here you are, here's a few weeks at home watching Netflix, you'd be like, yes, no responsibility. <laughs> and then months later, Netflix has got a bit old. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah. It, it's it's to the point where like I, I like I've been working on cars and like whatever I can do to stay busy now. Like I I can't just lay in bed watching Netflix anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I I want to circle back around and come back around to hunting. Um, uh, and I want to go back to this to that point of you butchering your own uh your own deer, um. And the question I have to ask, because I have butchered my own deer, I did it for the first time last year, so I I know what it was involved for me. How on earth did you achieve that? <laughs> I don't know how to really explain it. It's almost like you just need to see it. Um, it it definitely took some hard work. <laughs> yeah. 
it, it took me probably three hours to, to butcher it once I got it home. Like it, it wasn't like a quick, you know, like my dad, he can do one up in maybe 30 minutes or less, you know, but for me, it definitely took me a lot longer. Um, I hold the knife in my, in my foot. Um, I will stand on one leg sometimes. Other times I'll use like a bar stool so I can put both feet up to grab stuff and, and slice and stuff like that. Um, once I get, once I get all the hair and the skin off and stuff like that, then I'll move it to a table where I can clean it up. And then obviously that's where I take the meat off the bone. Just takes time. Uh, just pretend like I would be doing it like, you know, like somebody with arms but shorter arms or just using your feet for everything. But the process is still the same. Jeez. That feeling of satisfaction must have been immense for you when you'd achieved that. <laughs> you know how, <laughs> do you know how many looks you get when you're in the middle of your yard and you're skinning a deer? And of course uh, you got blood on your legs, like up to your, up to your knees and you're holding this knife and you have no arms and people drive by. They're like, what is that? What is happening there? Like, <laughs> yeah, was it like what was that TV program that was about when I think I think when I was a kid that uh, you get two hundred and fifty dollars for putting in a clip of something crazy happening, you know, a video clip. Yeah, um, so yeah, you, I, I know what you're talking about. You could do you skinning a deer using a knife in your feet. So that would be pretty epic. But equally, if you were to do the if you were to do the deer in your front yard, you could just video all the car crashes on the street outside and you'd make a killing. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, I had the cops called one time. Uh, we somebody somebody that we knew had hit a deer, and so we had got a, a tag from the DOT to you know skin it. And so we were it was dark out, and we were in the middle of um, not the interstate, but there's like a grass median between the two roads or whatever. So we're we have the headlights shining in the ditch, and we're skinning the deer or whatever. Me and my buddy, and this car pulls up. Cause we had our flashes on and there's like three old ladies in the car. And one of the ladies like, is everything okay? And, and I turn around and I got blood on my shirt and I have no arms. And my buddy stands up and he's holding a knife and his arms are all covered in blood. And all I hear is the lady in the back go, 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 go. <laughs> and they're like, they, 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 they speed off. Like they thought I was getting butchered. <laughs> It's a freaking massacre. <laughs> yeah. And then like not even 10 minutes later, the cops pulled up with their sirens on. And they called the cops on us. <laughs> uh, it was, I laughed for like an hour. It was so funny. Wow. See, I think your life's far more funny and far more enjoyable than mine, um, minus arms. I think that's uh, def definitely got to be a, a, a shit. <laughs> I think it would be funny to make a TV show where the cameras follow me around and I do like random things and then you film people's reactions. Mm. Mm -hmm. There would be a show there. There's got to be. There was a, yeah. a TV program in the UK when I was a kid called Challenge Annika and it was this female tv presenter who like sat in her kitchen one morning they, they filmed her and they give her an envelope and it says like go here and build an orphanage in the next two weeks or i don't know whatever it, but not not just that but um go um backpacking with lions in africa or all sorts of crazy stuff and they followed the whole journey and i think we could do like a challenge mat and <laughs> video your problem solving but also the rest of the world's reaction to seeing what you come up with because i think both of those are, are gold uh, you know i i think that's awesome i've always thought that it would be a good idea I, and i like entertaining people and i love comedy and making people laugh so we right. just got to find the right producers <laughs> Well, so here's something you don't know, but I'll sh um, actually need, neither does most of the world. Um, I've just bought a TV channel. Um, really? Yeah, for um, for We Get Outdoors, We Get Outdoors TV. So uh, we haven't launched officially yet. But that's happening in like six weeks' time. But I own a TV channel, like the whole of a TV TV channel. So. I'm sure we can do something because I can give you airtime for nothing. Like, let's do it. 
<laughs> we oh uh, you know let me just tell you my i have like some awesome ideas so one time i was trying to simulate how to train with adrenaline so i jumped i jump out of a plane and then i land close to my target and then i shoot arrows while i still have that adrenaline from free falling while it's pumping through my system and then i learn how to control it and then when it goes away i jump out of the plane again I've actually done that and videoed it. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine me doing this while doing this while I'm falling out of a plane, like I'm trying to fly, and I'm just like, <laughs> I have no idea how you pull that off. That is, cr- that is, you know, I've coached lots of sports at Olympic level, so rugby, kayaking, all sorts of things like that, um, and. I'm often regarded as the weird guy who comes up with crazy shit for his athletes to do. But even I have never got as far as jumping out of a plane to go and pump up adrenaline to go and get people to react. (laughs) Uh, I told you, I I like to have a good time and live life. And so. Okay. So tell me, what's the craziest thing you've done that everybody else thinks you just shouldn't do? I mean, is it jumping out of a plane or is it something else? Uh, no, I, no, I do lots of crazy things at this point. My people who know me, they're pretty much used to my crazy ideas. In fact, my best friend is always trying to tell me he's like the voice of reason. He's like, dude, I really don't think you should do that. <laughs> so for a long time, I've been trying to figure out, I want to set the Guinness world record for the fastest anybody's ever towed a camper. R- right. But, where I where I literally get a truck, like build a diesel truck or a truck that has lots of power, and I hook a camper to it, and I try to go over 150 miles per hour. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> with my feet, driving with my feet. <laughs> of course you can do that. There's got to be, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like... <laughs> 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 and 150 miles an hour is fast, but it's not that fast. It's not like it's not like uh, you know, like fighter jet speed. It's it's doable. No. Yeah, I I drove a, I drove a car over 200 miles an hour before, so I know what it, I know what you know. In fact, we actually um, during the summer I raced redneck rally racing. It's it's where you you build a car and. The, the track is like a autocross track for motorcycles, but you use cars, but you use cars. And no, listen, so the rules, I, I'm not even joking. It's so much fun. The, the rules state you have to have a front wheel drive car. That's all it states. So last year I put two turbos sticking out of the hood on a Toyota Camry. And I got, there was 150 people that showed up for the race. And after everything was done, I got third and almost won the whole thing. And, and is like crashing into people permitted or what's the deal? Yeah, you can, yeah, there's, there's, there's crashing, you're jump, you're, you're launching your cars off jumps. Like, it's awesome. I'm not. <laughs> that sounds like the best yeah. thing ever. It is so much fun. It is so much fun. And you literally, you don't like win a lot of money you 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 win like a thousand dollars and you get a trophy that's cool but it's literally for show so like my buddy he races with me too and he's known because he takes um he has a, a blow-up doll called ursula and he he ta- he tapes it to his car so every time he ramps over this, ursula's doing like the superman on the back of this car like whoa like it's like you you can decorate your car however you want to. It, it's, yeah. So usually there's like seven of those a year. Well, COVID happened last year. So we only got like two races in last year. But this year they're promising like seven or eight races. So and that's, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I So I, I literally went live on one of the days and I actually catch a guy getting flipped over and catching on fire on my camera. And like they they jump out and they roll his car back over, he gets back in it and they start the race again. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously you have safety equipment on, right? Like you have roll bar, they make you have a roll bar and wear helmets and, and all that stuff. But like it's it's like a no joke fun thing. Like it's 
And do you just trash your t- trash your car throughout the race, or uh, it, like it must get some abuse? Yeah. So usually half the half the time, your car pretty much when you're done with it, you just take it to the scrapper and you build another one. <laughs> but I've been pretty lucky because I've had my car for about two years. And I've been in four or five, three, four races with that specific car. And it's still like, I, that's the one that I almost won with and got third. And it's pretty much in perfect shape still. I just, I just try to avoid all the major stupid stuff. Like if, like, I know people are trying to run into each other. I try to avoid them because half the people lose because they break their cars on the first lap because they want to like ramp a 10 foot ramp <laughs> and, you know, that's, but yeah, most of the time they're they're trash when you're done. So when you come up with the next crazy idea that Matt's going to have a go at, and um, you tell your wife and kids, um, <laughs> what a, what? I don't a, tell them. You don't, don't tell them. I, I do it and then ask for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're two alike. Uh, last January, um, my, my my wife woke up in the morning and she saw me packing a bag, and she's like, "What's what's the bag for?" I'm like, "Oh, I've got a flight at lunchtime." She said, "Oh, where? What's what's going on?" I said, "Oh, I'm I'm off to the US to work for the next four weeks." <laughs> was the, first, she heard about it. So let's let's uh, come back to archery. Good. You've got a target behind you. Do you have a bow and an arrow? And could you show us what this really involves? Would that be all right? Yeah, I, w- I would love to. So first of all, don't try this at home. If you see behind me, there's a window. So I am a trained professional, I think. <laughs> so I'm going to stand up real quick and show you something. This is the uh, only thing that's modified to allow me to shoot a bow and it's a strap I designed and it goes over my chest mm. and over my shoulders and it tighten it up here. Is that the release for the arrow? Oh yeah. So this is the release. Uh, it's a device that goes, yeah. And then it, this will go I activate it with my chin. It's like right here. And then as I pull with my shoulder it activates the trigger. Wow. So all all my bows that I have are not designed to be shot with people with feet. So like they're completely normal bows. Um, The bow that I'm going to actually show you now is the bow that I will be using at trials this year and uh, hopefully at the games this year as well. Um, I'm going to grab it. Awesome. It's pretty it's pretty big. I have a lot of weight on it. It's orange. I'm going with the orange theme this year. When I draw this bow back, um, the max I'm allowed to shoot uh, in competition is 60 pounds. So I'm drawing 60 pounds back with my feet. All my hunting bows, though, are anywhere from 70 to some of my other ones are uh, almost 90 pound pole. Wow. That's 45 kilos. Yeah, it's it's but I use my legs. So a lot of people are like, why do you do that? But since I'm using my legs, like I it's it doesn't feel like a lot at all. Mm. I'm just gonna shoot that white balloon for you. So I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but put the arrow on like this. Not that one, apparently I Robin Hooded that one. <laughs> Robin Hooded that one. <laughs> I was shooting um, earlier, and I shot one arrow and it hit the other one, and the knock is a little messed up on it. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. In fact, that's actually what happened to me in Rio. Um, when I shot, my knock broke, and it caused it caused it to go off target. Ah. Uh. In fact, you, so that's what happened. All right. I don't know if you can see that okay. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. All right. So I draw towards the target like that. It's kind of like my workout.
Boom. Boom. Just like that. And that's how I shoot a bow and arrow, whether I'm in the woods or shooting for medals. So you're um you're almost doing it uh in re- uh, the the mechanics you're using are almost in reverse to how somebody with arms would use it because often with an arm you have a straight you have a straight arm holding the bow and then you pull back with the uh, with the opposite hand whereas all of that that pull back is now a push forwards with your leg right mm-hmm. Yeah, my my core, my chest all become the stable part. And then I push my foot away from my chest. And then I lock my shoulder in. I usually bring it up and just lock it in and set it. But yeah, that's... And then my my push-pull is more with my foot versus Mm -hmm. like usually they teach you to push-pull with your arms. Like usually you're expanding and and stuff. But me, it's just kind of pushing with my foot forward, yeah. Shit. I learn Mm -hmm. something every day. This is brilliant. Absolutely incredible. So, um, what? What? I, I want to ask you a question. You've probably been asked lots before, but um, but what, what's your advice to to parent? You're a parent. I'm a parent. But what's your advice to parents out there who they have their baby arrive and they're like, "Well, this wasn't quite what we were expecting," um, and as a parent, you want the very best for your kid possible. But really, you're kind of clueless at that point in time because your your frame of reference was how you were brought up. And I should imagine pay people feel lost. So what sort of advice do you have for people? I think, first of all, you should you know give it a chance. Um, you can talk to a lot of experts and experts are going to give you their envi- own advice. But a lot of experts told my parents that I should be put up for adoption or I'm going to need this or need that. I think the best thing you can do as a parent is have a very open mind about it. Um, you're, it's going to literally be day to day. Like it's literally going to be a learning experience for you and, and your child. But you have to remember to keep an open mind about it. You have to be willing to think outside the box and try different things. And 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 like we talked about earlier, even let that child kind of learn on his, uh, him, you know, him or her. They have to learn on their own a little bit. Um, you know, like you can guide them and stuff like that. But they're ultimately going to have to do it on their own. And, and I would also say maybe don't baby them don't <laughs> don't do everything for them all the time because then they're going to get to that mentality where they're going to have to, re- they're not going to, they're not going to be able to do anything. They're going to have to rely on people. Um, mm. So it's okay to let them do a little bit of that stuff on their own. It, it strikes me that with all parenting, um, you can bring your kids up to either be independent or victims. And there's probably not much, mi- mm-hmm. not much space in the middle. And it would be very easy to bring up your kid who's got a, a disability of some sort as a victim who then just spends the rest of their life living as trying to, I don't know, get uh, live off money from the government as opposed to finding yeah. a way to earning money for themselves. It's quite a, a hard thing mm-hmm. to achieve, I think. Yeah. Well, even, even now it's funny because I, I know people that are completely able-bodied and have nothing wrong with them and they complain all the time that they have no money and need money to pay their bills. And I hear them talk about it like literally all the time. But how come they don't go get a job? And it's, you know, why are you coming and asking me for help? You know, like, it's because I work, <laughs> right? Like, why, why, like, that, that to me, like, never made any sense. And so I'm just hoping I can raise my kids that they're not like that. Like, I want them to learn how to work for their money. Like, Carter's 14, or he turned 14, or he's 15, but when he was 14, he already had a job. Right. So like I'm already teaching him how to have a job and he wanted a phone, but he pays for his own phone. But mm. that's because he has a job. You know, mm. like I think those are all important things to teach your kids. And so do you take your boys hunting with you? Uh yeah. So Cameron, actually, believe it or not, he's the middle one. Um, he loves turkey hunting. In fact, he's really good with videoing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he likes the video. The younger ones, um, not so much because they don't know how to be quiet yet. <laughs> um, they enjoy going out in the woods and stuff like that, but they they don't they they want to talk and like, look, dad, there's a deer. Or 
<laughs> Carter, Carter, I used to take Carter uh, when he was seven. I started taking him hunting at seven, and he's 15 now. Jeez. And, and do they um, mm-hmm. they use bows or rifles, or what's what's their thing? Either either one, it don't matter. Whatever it, whatever the season is, I prefer bows, but I also, you know, have guns that we will go out if we need to. In Iowa, they just got rid of high powered rifle season, so the only thing you can use for deer in Iowa are bows, shotguns, or muzzle loaders. Well, that's not much use. I bet the deers are thankful, but it's not much use to everybody anybody else. <laughs> yeah, so you got to get good at all of that stuff, really. And and it's funny because um, in order to use a shotgun, they give you certain seasons. You literally get like three days or four days the entire year to go shotgun hunting. That's but not- if you hunt a deer with a, it's not that long. But if you hunt a deer with a bow, they give you from like October. You get to hunt like the beginning of October, November, December, and then you end like one or two weeks into January. Yeah, because otherwise, after that, the the does can be with calves, and you end up shooting a pregnant yep. doe or whatever. Correct. That was why they got rid of the high power rifle season because a lot of guys were sh- like, you're only allowed to shoot bucks in the high power rifle season. But a lot of guys, because it was colder out, um, they would see a really big body doe, um, and or. Uh, Sorry, you were sorry. You're only allowed to shoot does. So they would see a really big body doe, and they would shoot the doe, and then they'd go up on it and realize that it was a buck that had already shed his antlers. Oh. So like, and it was just becoming a problem. So that's why they that's why they said they got rid of the season for it. But, so but I'm fine with it because archery is my main thing. <laughs> yeah, you just got to get a little bit closer. Well, a lot closer, maybe with a with a bow than you do with a high powered rifle of some sort. That that is correct. My furthest my furthest shot, um, and I was successful with it, uh, was seventy seven yards. So that must have been with a ninety pound. That was that was an eighty two pound bow. Yeah, yeah, and that- I had a pass through. It went completely through the deer, and it went about thirty yards. What? But I don't recommend. Yeah, I don't. I don't recommend that shot. Like it literally, <laughs> it literally was the last day of the season. So if I didn't, if I didn't shoot anything, like I was eating a tag, and I was waiting for does, and there had been no does coming by, and this deer, this buck walked out, and he was in, on the list of um, deer management bucks, and and so. He came out and it was 77 yards and I had maybe 10 minutes left of shooting light. And so I decided to take the shot and it, and in my case, it worked out fine, but it's not a shot I would normally recommend, but I also shoot long distance. I currently hold the Guinness world record. I don't know if you know that for the longest, most accurate archery shot. No, I didn't. Come on. Tell me about it. You're a Guinness, yeah, no, really. Olympian and a Guinness world record holder. Yeah. Babe, you know where that uh can you do you know where the, the plaque is? Or that piece of paper, the Guinness paper is in the front in the front room. We're gonna get it. I'm gonna tell you about it though. I think it's in the front room. Maybe. Can you see it's in a glass? So yeah, so um I have the Guinness World Record for the longest, most accurate archery shot where I hit a target confirmed. Um a confirmed hit on target at 310 yards. That's a long way. It's a long way. It's not even my furthest shot. I've actually been able to do it at 500 yards, but there was no Guinness people around to confirm it, and nobody has broken this one yet. So even though there's there's YouTube videos now of, of guys shooting past 310 yards, but it's never been confirmed with the guidelines set by Guinness. So I still have the record. How do you manage that shot? Because my mind says you've got to shoot in the right direction, but also upwards as well to get like an arc in place. And then take yes. into account wind and bucket loads of other things. Yeah. So for for the actual Guinness record, I had to use what they call a FIDA standard FIDA bow, which is only 60 pounds. I wasn't allowed to shoot more than 60 pounds. 
So, and you only get three attempts and you have to call your shot. So basically it prevents people from going out in the field and shooting all day. And on their 700 arrow, they hit the target and say they have the record. So I literally had to look at the guy from Guinness and be like, this is for score. And then I have to hit the bullseye on the, on the shot that I tell him I'm going to hit the bullseye. And if you can't do it in three attempts, you have to wait like a year to do it again. So like it's basically like you're telling the guy, I'm going to go out right now and I'm going to hit this bullseye at 310 yards with a 60 pound bow. It took about five and a half seconds ish, five seconds about for the arrow to get to the target. So I'd shoot and then you'd see the balloon pop like five seconds later. And then like two seconds after the balloon pop, you'd actually hear the pop of the balloon. <laughs> That's incredible. In a room, maybe. Apparently, we lost the Guinness. I thought we just had it somewhere. Is oh yeah, it's in the safe. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So I apparently I keep the Guinness record in the safe, but I keep my all my medals hanging on the outside of the safe. <laughs> just oh, Guinness well. record. Anyway, yeah, you can you can, um, but yeah, so I have that record, so. How do you factor in the wind in that? Because arrows are quite what well, they're they're a little bit slower and a lot lighter than a bullet and a lot bigger than a bullet as well. Everything. Yeah, so someone scaled it once for me. Here's I have one. They sent me like three or four copies, but this and I have one in a glass frame. But hey, look at that bad boy. Yeah, for sure. That 930, yeah, that's right, 930 feet, 310 yards. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, the day that I did that, it was like 12 mile an hour gusts. And so it was pretty hard to calculate the wind. Like I, I had just like, I had a spotter um, who read the wind for me. And I've shot enough over the years that I knew. I'm going to hand this back to you, but I'm going to, um, I knew where to aim. Like it was almost like, basic instinct i guess i should say i think roughly at, at that distance i was shooting five i think it was like almost five or eight feet uh to the right of the target to account for wind drift and then the angle that i was shooting at was like 30 30 degree angle up possibly i think like it was I had to do all the math the day before because, I mean, you can do a lot of the calculations and to get you close, but then it's instinct at that point. So this is like Navy SEAL sniper of the archery world. Yeah. So the 300, but if you take, um, somebody did the math for me. If you take the arrow and the speed of the arrow and, and you scale it to like a 50 caliber rifle, it would be like a fit, like as far as the time that it's in the air and all that stuff, it's like, somebody with a 50 cal rifle shooting and hitting a target a little over a mile away. Jeepers. But if, if, if you watch the guys with the rifle shoot those shots, they're usually are laying prone and they have their guns are on bags and they, for the most stable possible with archery, you don't get to do that. You have to freehand everything. So basically it'd be like a guy with a 50 cal free, just standing upright and trying to hit a target at a little over a mile away with no help of anything. I, I'm a really talkative guy, but I'm actually lost for words. That's just absolutely incredible. How did you it, come it was, with this as a challenge? Well, it's like, right now, I'm just going to go for the longest, most accurate shot I can achieve, and I'm going to get a Guinness World Record. Why not? I, I saw a guy, and he was shooting like 70 yards, and he was talking all big or whatever, and I'm like... He made it sound like it was really hard. So I I shot that the next day at practice. I went out and I shot 100 yards. And within like five minutes, I was hitting the middle. I'm like, that's easy. In fact, I have a video where I actually hit a cheese it at 100 yards. <laughs> like a little cheese it. Um, so I was like, well, how far can I shoot and still be accurate? And so I just kept moving the target back until I found it was like 310 yards and I was still able to hit it consistently. And then at that point, my agent was like, um, you're telling me about all your long range shooting. And I found Guinness actually has a record for that. 
I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, how far is he? He's like, the Guinness World Record at the time when I broke it was only like 100 yards. <laughs> so I'm like, 310 yards it is. Let's dial it up. Let's do it. <laughs> and so we put it all in place down in Texas. Uh, of course, they picked the windiest day of the year. and <laughs> <laughs> Made it happen. <clears throat> wow. Jeepers, you're... Yeah, you should stop telling me stories. I get more impressed by the second. Um, now, a, a little th- a question I've got for you. We we both, um, I wouldn't say I'm a hunter now, but I'm certainly somebody who's been hunting and filled his freezer and I'll go again this year and do the same. Um, but equally, a lot of people get really shitty with me about going hunting and filling my freezer. What mm-hmm. What words do you have for those shitty people? <laughs> I've been, I've been, I've been, I guess, fortunate enough that I don't, I don't really pay attention to those people. Like I literally, uh, well, what did someone say? Uh, why don't you go to hy or, or why don't you go to your local food store and buy meat like the rest of, like everybody else does where, where animals aren't hurt. And I was like, that lady has no idea. <laughs> meat is meat. Right. Like it doesn't matter if you harvest it yourself or you go to the store and buy it. Like it's still <laughs> right. Like the same so thing. I, I just don't listen. Yeah. Like I, what I try to do is I try to minimize my, what I do. So if you go like on my, I don't post about it on social media. Um, I have pictures of me with all the animals, you know, that I shoot and, and I'll send it to sponsors and, and they can post it on their social media stuff. Um, on my social media stuff, I don't ever, even though I would like to, I don't ever post anything about like an animal I shot or anything like that, just because I'm trying, I'm trying to keep it causes right now. The world is so sensitive about everything. <laughs> and I still make my living based on sponsors. So I have to be very careful and, and stuff, but look, you, you can't listen to those guys. Like don't, don't get into a, an argument on social media about why you can shoot deer. Like just let it go. And you do you like, you just do you. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would say. I've a, I've got a, I've got a challenge for people whenever they comment to me on what it is I've done or, or doing. I'm like, number one, go to a factory farm where they only raise animals for, for, you know, for Safeway, mm-hmm. for the supermarket or whatever it may well be. Go, mm-hmm. go there. And then as you're walking around, see A, how they're treated, but look at the jars and the barrels around them that have got hazard toxic like symbols mm-hmm. on the outside of it. Well, yep. firstly, they're feeding that to your to your meat. Um, so go, yep. go have a look for yourself. And then go to an abattoir and watch, a, watch an animal as it arrives and it spends six hours in a pen and then it goes through mm-hmm. and gets killed and comes out the other end. You go watch that. Yeah. And then come hunt with me and you see a deer fall at 300 meters with one shot and it's dead. It is it's dead before it even heard the bang of the rifle. Um, yep. Now, 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 now tell me about the ethics behind meat. Um, and, uh, it's very funny. People normally swear at me at that point in time and then disappear from my life. <laughs> which is, which is good. You don't, you don't need them in your life at that point anyway, but you make, you make a lot of good points. Um, I've been around, uh, I grew up on a farm and you know, our animals I've seen, I've been to chicken farms and turkey farms and, and stuff like that. And I see how people raise it like, you know, millions of chickens a year just to get chicken out. And it's, I would rather go out in the woods and harvest the turkey. Um, mm. you're, they're getting better quality of everything, you know? Like, they basically just pump them full of whatever they can do to make them fat and big as possible in a short amount of time. It's a, it's a, a crazy, disconnected world that we live in. And it does feel very disconnected in terms of mm. people... People who think that they're clever maybe aren't as clever as they think they are. I think that would be the best way of politely phrasing what's going through my head. I, I'm, with, <laughs> I, I'm with you on that one. That's why I just don't start arguments or try to, I just, it's not even, it, for me, it's not even worth my time because I feel like on some of those people, no matter what you say, what proof you show them, they're still not going to like it or be on your side or some people you can do that with and obviously they understand but 
some of the people that are just out there saying that stuff, you're never going to win that argument. <laughs> well, no, because I mean, the starting point is, you know, my recommendation to people, I say it almost with the, my tongue in my cheek, because I'm 99.9% .9 sure they will keep talking from a textbook and never go and actually physically experience what I suggest for them. And so they don't yes. have a real frame of reference in anything. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, they, they they really don't. Anyway, let's, let's not get on that topic because I'll end up to the Second Amendment quite quickly. Then Donald Trump <laughs> will go to shit. <laughs> so, so we got Tokyo this year, but uh, what's what, what are your goals, Matt? What are you aiming towards? Well, um, I've made it to the finals in every single tournament that I ever wanted to be podiumed in except for one. And that's Vegas, the Vegas tournament. Um, I've came close num number of years, um, where perfect scores 900 and I've shot eight ninety nines. Um, so that's the only tournament that's eluding me right now. But as far as Tokyo is concerned, you know, obviously I want to go do my best. I want to be able to do my process. Um, I, I would of course like to do a, you know, win a medal or whatever. Um, but at this point, like I know what it takes to get to the metal round. Um, and I just got to remember my process. I got to remember what I've been training for, what I, you know, I, I can't get too excited and too ahead of myself. I feel like sometimes when you start thinking about metal, 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 you put too much pressure on yourself early on and, and it can cost you. So for me, I'm just going to go and based on whatever, all the stuff that happened, we, we don't even know. We're not guaranteed another game. So I'm just going to go into this one. If it happens, like potentially it's my last one and just enjoy every second of it. And and hopefully the outcome works in my favor. So uh, take every shot, treat it as a unique thing and don't worry about mm -hmm. anything beyond that, beyond that shot. Any, don't, don't worry about anything. I can't control myself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess even with like your gear manufacturer malfunction, um, there's only so much, you don't have that much control over that. You know, if something breaks, it breaks. Right. It mm -hmm. is what it is. Yeah. You, you can't, you can't control it. Like it's, it's just, if it happens, it happens. And, and what about beyond Tokyo? Are, we, are you going to carry on on an Olympic cycle or do you have bigger, grander plans with archery? Are we going to have the Matt Stusman bow or what, what are we going to be? What, what's there's, there's more to it than 2021, isn't there? Yeah, so uh, I got a bunch of cool things that we're working on right now um, that I can't exactly say yet. Um, but I would, <laughs> I would like to. I st I want to shoot a games in the U.S. and so L.A. would be what twenty? Is that twenty twenty eight? Is that when yeah. L.A. is? That's right. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm gonna at least continue to um, you know try to be part of Team USA until then. Um, but I'm also trying to set myself up for what happens when that's over. Um, so I got some stuff going on that hopefully will start up maybe next summer, which, which could be good and entertaining. So uh, as of now, I'm just focusing on family, archery, secret projects. I like to get into more of the entertainment side of things. I love entertaining and I feel like I have a passion for it. So uh, I guess that's kind of the ultimate goal there. Come, we've got Challenge Matt, and I own a TV channel. Let's do it. Have you? Uh, um, the last thing I did was on Netflix, a Netflix special called Rising Phoenix. Have you heard of it? I have, but I haven't watched it. Tell me more. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a it's a documentary, but it's it's based on real events and shows real clips and footages and and. It's basically there's it follows seven athletes through the games and and it talks about um, from London you know from like when I started all the way through Rio and kind of leading up into potentially you know Tokyo. If you haven't watched it, it's amazing. Like it, it there's a one of the athletes that is involved at a young age where he was living at um, his mom got chopped up by a machete in front of him and then they chopped his arms off or his nose leg. they tried to chop him up and he woke up in the hospital and ended up losing a leg and now he's like one of the fastest men on the planet like it's it's incredible like it, if you haven't seen it you need to watch it 
I've just written it on my to-do list. I don't, to be honest truth with you, I don't watch much TV. So, um, I, but uh, this is something. If you recommend it, it's got to be worth watching. I'm going to go check it. Rising Phoenix. Rising Phoenix on Netflix. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a good one to watch with your kids. <laughs> You say that like in under a minute from there's this fast, fast athlete who watched his mum get shot up um, and then go watch it with your kid. It, it, it takes you. <laughs> yeah, it takes you on a really good roller coaster ride. Like there, there's ups and downs and there's ups and downs. And then like it's a, it's it's there was times when I was watching it in the previews or um, before they released it on Netflix and I was watching it and I actually caught myself going, oh, what's going to happen next? But I was there. I knew what happened next. (laughs) (laughs) That's incredible. Well, cool. Uh, Listen, Matt, we're going to bring this to a a close, but I just want to say, I want to say thank you to you because um, people need to go and pioneer the way and show what's really possible, no matter what your circumstances are. And um, from jumping out of a plane to winning medals at the Olympics to shooting a bow and arrow and getting your own deer in a few months to whatever it may well be, you're taking what people think is possible and smashing it out of the park. And Mm -hmm. that is like people like me, we have nothing to grumble about really. Um, And your, your attitude and that inspiration is is beyond incredible. So thank you for what you bring to the world. I, I appreciate it. I uh, just want to say one thing. Mm. If you were to walk into my house, besides a picture on the wall, you would not know that there is an armless guy that lives in this house. I don't need anything modified. I don't need millions of dollars. I figured out how to live life armless without any of that extra stuff. Like my house is completely normal, normal stove, doorknobs, like there's nothing in it that's modified whatsoever. And I just want whoever's listening to understand that, you know, life is what you make it. It's really up to you to decide how you want to live your life. And if you want to live it modified or unmodified, that's up to you. But at the end of the day, you can totally have full control over all that stuff. That is incredible. And I agree with you 100%. And I just hope that uh, the listeners out there go and embrace that and say, I can do whatever I please if I put my mind to it because Matt has led the way. Um, for sure. Matt Dusman, thank you for being awesome. Um, I, I want to book you for a rematch of this interview when your secret projects come live or just after your medal at the Olympics um, because uh, I think that will be a super cool conversation. But uh, go ahead, be awesome. And if we at We Get Outdoors can support you in any way, please ask. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for having me.